Hi, I'm Michael Paranick with Paranick Law Injury Attorneys, and I'm here with Manly Frazier, incoming associate. And Manly uh, is fresh out of law school, fresh off taking the bar. How was it? It was great. Can't complain. Yeah, they good. Was it two days? Yeah, two days. Uh, 200 questions, um, actually 303 essays, and um, it was a blast. Can't recommend it enough. <laughs> <laughs> in fact, since the bar, we've been giving him questions every day just to keep him fresh. So, uh, but he's he's gonna pass it. We have good vibes coming his way. But today we're gonna talk a little bit about a uh, new law, uh, a change in the law as it relates to personal injury and how it affects you. And I got Manly here as backup. He's done all the research. He's the expert. He knows everything there is to know about it. I'm gonna rely on him and his expertise. <laughs> So, <laughs> with that being said, uh, the first thing I guess we'll talk about is the uh, statute of limitations. What are your thoughts on that, Manly? I mean, the reduction from four to two years isn't out of the ordinary. I mean, Georgia has a two-year limit on auto negligence, but um, the fact that the law went into effect immediately um, kind of took us and a lot of other attorneys by surprise. I mean. Um, what would have been reasonable for us and our clients is to have, you know, at least a few months grace period to get these claims in and really do what's best for our clients. And, um, unfortunately, we had to make that abrupt decision and with obviously informing them of what we needed to do to protect their rights, um, we had to take drastic action. And, I know a lot of other law firms did too, and uh, it's, I, yeah, go yeah. on. It's, uh, I mean, the, I know there's other states that, that have two-year statute of limitations, and uh, this bill, and let's kind of zoom out here, the bill was one where the governor had decided that he was going to do something to curb uh, litigation. He was going to say, uh, the argument was that we're going to help the consumer by making sure trial attorneys can't bring, you know, cases that they're going to be hampered from bringing claims, right? Yeah. So, the, but the two-year statute of limitation doesn't really seem to help that because it changes the amount of time you have to file a lawsuit. So now we're going to be bringing claims quicker. We're going to typically have a case in pre-suit where we can try to settle it out of court. And if that doesn't work, we're gonna file a lawsuit. So now we don't have four years to do that. We don't have four years to file a claim. Now we have two years to file a claim and to bring it to uh, a complaint stage where we're filing a lawsuit and now we're spending a lot of time and money litigating it. So uh, that, that is one issue that everyone seems to be concerned with, but I don't think it's major. And as you pointed out, it's kind of the norm in other states. So, um, and then the, uh, we used to have pure comparative negligence. What are, your, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, so with pure comparative negligence, I mean, you could be, as a plaintiff, somebody that is injured, you could be 90% negligent for the uh, accident or event that happened, um, but you could still recover that 10% on that 100% scale. And um, with the new law, comparative fault, it would make it to where if the plaintiff was just 50, 51% negligent, you would recover nothing. Right. So for example, let's say you're driving down the street and you forgot to put your lights on. It's early night time and another motorist blows through a red light going 100 miles an hour and totally wrecks your vehicle, um, defense attorneys are gonna be able to say, hey, plaintiff was negligent. He was driving without his lights on. Don't you think it's fair that he was at least half at fault for this? I mean, my client, I mean, he was speeding. He blew through the red light. He was negligent too. But if you find that plaintiff is at least half negligent, they get nothing. They recover nothing. So, yeah, and that's that's a really good point. It's and I think that prospectively, we look at cases like that and hope that juries make the right decisions. Right? They, they juries rely on 
good information, but what juries are actually doing is looking at evidence and they're making a calculation. And what juries have to do is they take the evidence and they decide what are the damages of the case, right? So if it's a car, your car's worth $10,000, you're in an accident, right? And you say, I want the cost of the, my car back. I want that cost back to me. The jury could go, okay, well that car was 10 grand. We're gonna put 10 grand down, those are the damages. And then a jury is gonna go, okay, but this was a 50-50 under your example. The plaintiff doesn't have his lights on. The other motorist is running through a red light, right? So a jury may say, well, we don't really know who's at fault here. We agree that the damage is 10 grand, but we don't really know who's at fault here. And so it's kind of rolling the dice there, right? So we'd like to think that this is some sort of science. It's just not, unfortunately. So we hope that juries make the right decisions you know, especially for our clients, because we're obviously biased as plaintiff's attorneys, but they, you know, it, it's hard to rely on that. And defense attorneys know that if they are able to convince a juror, hey, we'll, we'll take 40% fault. You're taking 40% fault, and now the plaintiff gets nothing. You were owed 10 grand, now you're not getting 10 grand. You know, and that money's gone. And uh, for us, we spend a lot of time and money bringing those cases to trial as well. So it's it's a it's a big deal. I think that that's uh, a very big deal, especially for slip and fall cases. You have anything else to add to that? Yeah, I mean, in that trial example with your car, I mean, if I'm forty percent negligent, at least I would get the other six thousand dollars of what my vehicle was worth. And right. The end, you're left out with nothing. Nothing. But um, yeah, premises liability cases. We're gonna have to cut. I forget what the um, the premises rule is now, isn't it? It's gone for one year. What do you, in in which regard? Like with one year, there like you can't beyond. It's a one year limitation now, right? No, no, no. It's completely gone. No, no, no. For for what? Uh, slip and fall cases? Yeah. So, uh, with regard to the statute of limitations? Yes. No, statute's just going to be the same. It's just, so the statute, and this is a good question because we just had a conversation about whether the statute was re retrospective. If you were in an accident, car accident, slip and fall three years ago, can you bring a case now if your attorney hasn't filed a lawsuit? And the answer is yes, you're not affected. Now, if you were in a car accident two weeks ago, after, what was it, the March 24th? March 24th. Uh, after the governor signed the bill, or even on that day, there's an argument. I, I don't want to get in that can of worms, but uh, if it's March 25th, and you're in a slip and fall, car accident, aviation accident, assuming it's a state case, right? You have two years to bring a lawsuit for all cases, so any negligence action. So that, you know, and that's kind of a big deal for us. Um, were there any other portions of this bill that you thought were interesting? I know we talked about the bad faith thing for a little bit and uh, what exactly that is, and that's a whole can of worms, but bad faith in, in general is what insurance companies fear by way of not paying on claims they should pay. And so if insurance companies don't pay on a case where they know they should pay, they can get hit with a bad faith lawsuit. So what happens in those cases is, let's say an insurance company has $100,000, you file a claim or you send them a claim, you say, hey, my client is severely injured, uh, pay this claim. And they never respond, you know, it's months before they respond, you file a lawsuit, you take the case to trial, you get a verdict, and your verdict exceeds that $100,000 limit, you're looking at a potential bad faith claim, right? What this does is it gives the insurance company the ability to fix their bad faith. So it says if you file a lawsuit, like in that example, my client is severely injured. Let's say this is a multi-million dollar claim. They're, they're severely injured. It gives the insurance company 90 days to fix their bad faith. So even if I send them a demand, even if they've done nothing and they had every reason to do what they're supposed to do, it gives them an additional 90 days to say, 
All we have to do is give you this hundred thousand dollars, even though we already acted in bad faith. We get an extra ninety days to act in good faith, um, which you know I, I get the idea behind, but it's it's like. I don't know. It's like committing a crime and getting a second chance to not commit it. It's like if you stole something, and I'm like, wait a second, we're gonna give you ninety days to give it back. Yeah. <laughs> we're gonna give you ninety days to give it back. If you do, we're not, we can't we can't come after you criminally. It's, yeah. it's wild. I mean, speaking of faith, uh, good or bad, I mean, we're kind of relying on good faith that by passing and signing into law the new provisions of this bill, we're sort of just trying to appease, for lack of a better term, the insurance companies and hope that they'll reduce rates for Florida citizens. And we have no guarantee that that'll happen. Right. So, I mean, we're effectively relinquishing a lot of our avenues to justice and for what? Just the hope that the insurance companies will lower rates? I mean, yeah, that's a good point. I would just hope there was more adequate assurances that we could um, rely on them doing that. But other than that, we just have to wait and see. There, there should have been something in the bill. This was a uh, one-sided bill. And, and I'm saying that as a plaintiff's attorney, but I'm also saying that because any objective person would look at the bill and say, this is not a bill that has any give and take. This is all a give to big insurance companies, right? And 99% of the citizens in the state of Florida lose. Like, as you said, we're all relinquishing a right. And the worst part about it is there's no guarantee, as you said. There's no guarantee that insurance companies have to reduce rates. And in fact, the last you know few tort reforms that I was around for, no one ever said, oh, wow, my insurance went down, you know, 100 bucks or whatever. Uh, that's you know something that we're going to be looking at in a year from now, asking people, did your insurance rates go down? And you know if you're watching this video in 2024, let us know if your insurance rates went down. If your auto insurance rates went down in the state of Florida, my guess is that they didn't. But I I propose that we get together with other attorneys and fund a study in a year asking and surveying people, asking if their insurance rates go down. I yeah. just don't think that they will. I mean, if it works and rates go down, then we can, you know, rest easy and say, you know, we gave up some of our rights to these claims and we have reduced rates. And, but until then, I mean, there's no evidence and no mechanism to help them or to force them really to lower these rates. Yeah. So those are my thoughts on that. Yeah. Yeah, me too. I, I agree with that. And you know, I know Kathleen Casadono, who's the uh, Senate president. She she said, "Oh, well, we're going to pay a lot, of, very close attention to what insurance companies are doing. And, and if there's a problem, come to my office and complain to me about it. You know, like if insurance companies aren't doing what they're supposed to do. There's another provision in here I want to get to, but before we do that. I want to conclude this video. We're going to do a round two. I want to talk about property insurance rates and what this bill means for property insurance, specifically um, what we call assignment of benefits. It's, it's going to be a big deal and it's going to affect how everyone's homeowner's insurance, even auto insurance uh, behaves. And uh, these are, I mean, what we're trying to do here is get to the ways that this bill affects you, and it's not a bill anymore, it's actually signed into law. So how about this, how this new law affects you? So uh, I think we're gonna touch on that. Is there anything else you wanted to discuss about this? Not until round two. Okay, so we're gonna do a round two coming soon, probably next week. Uh, stay tuned, like, subscribe, do all that fun stuff. And if you have any questions, feel free to contact us. Uh, you can message us through our channel or however you see fit. Thanks for tuning in.